Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about everything and anything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, intuitive counselor, and above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on the quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What is life all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. The podcasting world is a very crowded space, with many new podcasts being launched daily, so it's not easy for a podcast to get noticed and listened to these days. There are over 25,000 podcasts in the spiritual category alone, so to get to the top 250 ranking on Apple Podcasts at any time is a great achievement. This podcast has been regularly listed in the top 250 in the spiritual category across several countries, but the most recent news is especially encouraging. Over the past week, it was ranked number 24 in the UK and number 42 in Australia. Wow! (laughs) Out of 25,000 spiritual podcasts, that's an exceptional ranking. So I'd like to thank you for listening to my podcast and I hope that you will continue enjoying my conversations on many exciting topics with many great guests. So thank you, and as always, enjoy and please share. And now let's talk about today's episode. I'm always excited when presenting a topic that clearly bridges science and spirituality with no apology. Brave, bold, honest, persistent, with just one key objective, to get to the bottom of the mystery of life, with reverence for the spirit and respect for the mind. Channeling is one of such great topics, and probably my favorite one, as it reaches out to and touches pretty much every aspect of our existence as spiritual beings having a human experience on this earth plane. My first encounter with channeling was many years ago. Its classical form of direct messages from intelligences outside of our physical reality, designed to be more educational than for entertainment. I was absolutely fascinated with Jack Purcell channeling Lazarus, with his incredible messages opening up a whole new world and my understanding of it. Then there was Edgar Cayce, of course, and Seth, channeled by Jane Roberts, and many others. Today we are mature enough to understand that the phenomenon called channeling is so much more than conversations with discarnate entities or dead people. Still, there are many myths and misconceptions around it which I believe need to be dispelled and channeling explained so that we could embrace it as a natural and integral part of our life. To help me do just that, I have invited today an expert in this field who is both a scientist and a channeler, and so being right at the intersection of science and spirituality, she has a unique view on this phenomenon from both sides of the road, if you like. My special guest today is Dr. Helene Wabe. Dr. Wabe is the Director of Research at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, or IONS an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at Oregon Health and Science University and president of the Parapsychological Association. She is a naturopathic physician, holds a Master of Clinical Research degree and two postdoctoral research fellowships. 
Dr. Wabe has published and spoken internationally about her research into complementary and alternative medicine, mind-body medicine, extended human capacities, post-traumatic stress disorder, and their relationships to physiology, health, and healing. She is well known for her research into channeling under the auspices of IONS. And now, Dr. Wabe joins me from across the world. Hello, Dr. Wabe. Welcome to Quantum Living at the intersection of science and spirituality, of course. (laughs) It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you, Anna, for that wonderful introduction, and it is a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much. I'm sure that many of my listeners have seen you or may have seen you recently in the new documentary series on Gaia, titled Channeling a Bridge to the Beyond. Whose concept was it and is it based on your recent book? That's a wonderful question. I'm very excited about the release. Actually, the Gaia director, Jason Liggett, was the initiator of that project. And because of my work in channeling, he had heard about my name and reached out to see if he could interview me. So we spent a beautiful day together with his team, who was wonderful. And it really was an incredible conversation, a bit like the one we're having today, two people getting to know each other, sharing about things that are deeply important to us. And from there, those snippets of myself get to be in this documentary, which I'm really excited about. Oh, beautiful. Now, would you be able to share with us, to set the scene for this conversation, your personal journey that has led you to this cutting-edge work you currently do at the Institute of Noetic Sciences? So the audience heard my bio with all my credentials, which sets me up as a clinician, as a researcher. But what you didn't say in that bio is that when I was 10 years old, I went to my first seance, which happened to be at my grandparents' house, and that I was raised in essentially a spiritualist family. And that background deeply affected my upbringing, my worldview. My mother is a trance channeler, so is my uncle, my grandmother. Every person on my mother's side of the family has some type of channeling ability, and I do as well. So I had this personal background that affected me quite deeply, and yet I basically kept that hidden as I moved through my career because that wasn't something you could speak to openly. And it was blatantly taboo in academic environments. I became a naturopathic physician. I got into clinical research. I got my postdoctoral fellowships. I ended up at Oregon Health and Science University doing research on meditation, specifically with combat veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. And through that, I was perceived as this expert meditation researcher. So I was invited to go to IONS, which is the acronym for the Institute of Noetic Sciences. They were hosting a work group with expert meditation researchers. And the question was, what is the future of meditation research? Meditation has had a huge blossoming in the Western world, and the research has followed that. but It's very prescribed in terms of the type of research questions that were okay to ask within that domain. So this work group set out to look at all those things that weren't being talked about in regards to meditation research. That was my introduction to IONS, and I was completely amazed at their courage to ask research questions and conduct rigorous research about these esoteric topics. I connected with the CEO at the time and said, you know, this is incredible. Can I join your team? So it took a couple of years and many synchronistic events, but I ended up joining the IONS team as a scientist and then uh, now as the director of research. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Now, you are both an intuitive, as I understand, and a scientist. How easy or difficult 
is it for you to walk this path between the two worlds, so to speak, and literally <laughs> at the precarious intersection of science and spirituality? And I guess it takes a special type of person or a kind of person to be able to integrate those two aspects. Could you please speak to this for a moment? Yes, thank you. I will say that at this time in my life, it's easier than it has ever been to bring those two sides of myself together because I have permission at IONS to bring the spiritual in with the science. Now, that wasn't the case for most of my life. Imagine myself at an academic university doing interviews with combat veterans. I'm incredibly sensitive. I have my own channeling abilities, and I would be across from this person learning about their trauma, what happened in their trauma, and I would get downloads about their life, about who they may have killed, about the situation, what war they were in, et cetera, just coming in to me beyond what they were actually saying. And I couldn't bring that to our lab meeting and share that that was going on with me as well. So there was this, you know, conflict within myself about that. So I feel very grateful that today I can, in my work world, bring in the spiritual That being said, there still is a sense of schism, if you will, because often the tools that we use, the steps, the systematic methods we use in science, if spirit is not intentionally brought into that, it's easy to let that pass or let that be set aside. Now, at IONS, we have very specific intentful practices that we do to help incorporate this. We're very committed to the handshake of science and direct experience because I can talk to someone till I'm blue in the face about all the scientific studies that have been done about this. And yet if they haven't had a personal experience of it, it's often hard for them to take that in. So we're very invested in what we call the noetic handshake, which is the blend of the two. So I start every science meeting with what we call a noetic practice. Our all staff meetings include noetic slash spiritual practices. We set intentions for how we would like something to unfold. And the conversation is is quite open in that we don't have taboos about talking about these things. And yet we're also very rigorous about um, examining the evidence that is available, including objective evidence, but also subjective uh, phenomenological experiences are included in that as well. So back to your question, how easy is it? easy or difficult. It is easier now. I would definitely not call it easy because outside of my beautiful IONS team and community, there are still very intense taboos. And I walk the fine line of gauging my audience to see how vulnerable and transparent I can be about these topics. Absolutely. And this is so refreshing, by the way, to hear about the work and the approach to to research at the Institute. And we'll talk a bit more about it uh, in a moment. Now, channeling is much more than mediumship, as most people would associate it with, which is important to point out. And again, as it is often scary and of putting to many people who don't want to have anything to do with talking to the dead or to discarnate entities. So I'd like to ask you, what is channeling? If you could give us your definition and perhaps uh, describe any types or categories of channeling that people can relate to. And I understand from 
your other interviews that I have listened to, that you have mentioned two key types of channeling that is observed and expressed. So I would like to ask you if you could please elaborate and explain what is channeling by a contemporary definition, if I may put it this way. Yes. One of my biggest um, difficulties when I first started in this field was terms and definitions, because it seemed like there were so many words, ESP, psychic, channeling, mediumship, and people had different views on what each of those words meant. So I decided to make it very clear what I meant by that word. So the way that I describe channeling is actually a much broader umbrella term than many people think of it. And it is essentially this process of accessing information and energy from beyond our conventional notions of time and space, and that can appear receptive or expressive. Now, that's a big mouthful, right? So those experiences, channeling, I believe, is actually an innate ability of everybody, that everyone can do it. And yet the way that it shows up for them is unique and that the way channeling phenomenon uh, arise exists on a spectrum. So on one side, you might have the very common experiences of a gut hunch. I just, you know, know this is true. Many, most people can say that they've experienced that. And then on the other side of this spectrum, you have might have more rare experiences, like you mentioned mediumship or trance channeling, which I define as a subcategory of this broader definition of channeling. And then along that spectrum, you have many, many other types like precognition or knowing the future or telepathy or mind-to-mind communication or mind over matter, or otherwise known as psychokinesis. So there's such a huge variation in these experiences that all humans um, have had at one point or another. Now, I want to just clarify because you brought this, this up about the term mediumship. So the way that I use mediumship is that it is... Um, more specifically to connecting to supposedly deceased humans. And some mediums also believe that they are connecting to non-physical beings uh, that are not humans, that are multidimensional beings, etc. But that they do it in a way, uh, like in mental mediumship, where they might hear or see or receive that information, and then they translate it to the sitter. So they basically hear a message, and then they repeat it back to the sitter. I distinguish that from trance channeling, which can seem very similar, but in trance channeling, there's no translation, if you will. The channeler's body is acting as a vehicle for that supposed deceased person or non-physical being to use their body to speak through. So there's not this kind of translation aspect. Now, I believe that these are just aspects of the same channeling phenomenon and that they just look different with different people and the different perceived source. Now, you asked about, well, what's the difference between receptive and expressive? So receptive refers to what many of your listeners might know as the clairs, clairaudience, clairsentience, clairvoyance. The subjective experience is that you're essentially receiving or accessing information that you wouldn't normally know through your traditional five senses. You are um, bringing it in, if you will. Like I might meet somebody who I've never met before and I'm flooded with information. Oh, they have a daughter and she's sick and they're really stressed about that. There's no way I could have known that if no one told me it or the person didn't tell me that. 
So that's an example of receptive. An example of expressive is like mind matter interactions. Let's say that I am a healer and I'm directing positive healing intention towards some cells that in a research study, and then the researcher is observing the changes that are happening in that cell. So that's my consciousness effect, expression, my intention being expressed onto this cell. And so often these phenomenon are split up into those larger categories of whether it's receptive or expressive. Mm. It's fascinating for me to hear that you include that second category under the broader umbrella of channeling, i.e. sending your intention to heal, for example, or to change the the structure of, of DNA or induce any changes at the physical or physiological level. I've never thought about this as channeling. So what would you say is the common denominator of quote-unquote channeling for all those subcategories? What's actually happening in the process of channeling? That's a great question. To me, the crux of it is that we are, this is Helene's theory, if you will, and many people have stated (laughs) this theory, but we are all interconnected at some level. And You know, there's evidence that's growing for this concept, right? And so if we're all interconnected, then, and that my consciousness is not limited to my physical brain, then I can access information that I'm not privy to with my five senses. Not only that, my consciousness with intention can influence the world around me. So to me, the receptive and the expressive are the are different sides of the same coin. They're essentially sequelae to this fundamental nature of reality that holds us as all one, that we're all part of the same thing on some level. And it is a separating illusion that we stop at the boundaries of our body. And that once we embrace this idea of this interconnectedness or that we expand beyond that, that our consciousness goes beyond that, then those receptive and expressive aspects become more easily explainable. Beautiful. Thank you. And that's exactly my train of thought about channeling. And I think that most people can easily relate to it, that this is essentially about accessing information via other than our five senses, given the premise or based on the premise that all information is consciousness, which we are part of. So the concept of oneness, no boundaries. Beautiful. Ah, oh, I'm so excited to, <laughs> to have a conversation about this. So would you like to share with us a little bit about your own personal experience as a channel? And what I would be curious to hear is, if you'd like to share again, in which of those subcategories does your channel or channeling work? Could you talk to this for a moment? Yes. So as a young child, I was very sensitive, especially to emotions and energy around me. I could sense what someone was feeling without seeing them or having them tell me. I was very sensitive to energy and places. I would sometimes even get sick if I was in a crowd and there was a lot of emotion. I just, you know, would physically get ill. Growing up, I started to learn a little bit more about perhaps what that was. And I have a few stronger categories. One is I get goosebumps. So this is a what I call a aspect of my noetic signature where I feel things in my body. My body registers what is truth in a particular situation. If I'm faced with a decision and I think about one and I get goosebumps and I think about the other and I don't, if I follow the goosebumps, it usually works out. I have also given the example of number of times of just knowing 
information, getting downloads of information. So that happens to me quite frequently as well. I've also, yes, I've also recently learned how to trans channel. It does run in my family. And I was curious if I would be able to learn how to do it. And I guess it's been about three and a half years now. I did a protocol that was created by Patricio Trisoldi in Italy, where they used hypnosis for people to learn how to have an out-of-body experience and then how to trans-channel. So I used that method on myself and learned how to trans-channel. So if I choose to, I can trans-channel. So my experiences overall have been incredibly positive and have supported me dramatically in my life. And it's taken work and learning and growth to learn how to manage them in a positively impactful way. Yes, I wanted to also state, I mean, this is related to my personal as well, but what I realized with all these various terms is that it created such great confusion And I wanted to start from scratch about people's subjective experiences of channeling. Like if we erase all the terms, what do people actually say is going on with them? So we did this large, you know, this large study asking over 500 people to share their subjective experiences of channeling. And then we took all that information and we turned them into questions and we created it into an inventory for what we call the noetic signature, which is this unique expression of each person. And we found that there were 12 different characteristics that show up for people in their expression of the noetic signature, things like general intuition or telepathy, or knowing the future, or feeling it in your body, or feeling other people's physical sensations, or being able to hold an object and know information from it. So we ended up with 12 of those different characteristics. And so now I or anyone in your audience can take this noetic signature inventory to discover what their unique channeling expression looks like. And we see this as a tool to support people to understand a little bit more about themselves, to also highlight that there's no one way to channel and that there's no one channeling way that's better than another, that they're all beautiful and special and unique. And how do we support ourselves to discover our unique way to help ourselves in our lives, to make our lives more useful, more easeful, impactful, and improve our quality of life. What's better than one spiritual, inspirational, consciousness-expanding podcast? Two of them, of course. I know that if you love my show and the topics I explore with my guests, there is a podcast called The Skeptic Metaphysicians, which I know you will also enjoy. It is produced and hosted by Will Rodriguez and Karen Ensley, who will take you on a journey into the unknown in their weekly show that is engaging, mind-expanding and fun, with great guests and amazing conversations going into all sorts of rabbit holes. And... This show is a winner of the 2022 Signal Awards, Bronze and Listener's Choice Awards. You will find it at skepticmetaphysician.com. So, check it out. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And I will definitely include a link uh, in the show notes to the website where people can go and and take the survey. And I believe there are a couple more than one. So all information will be there. And I would encourage everyone interested in this topic to do that. And I will certainly be doing this very, very shortly. (laughs) Because yes, I am in the category of very sensitive 
people uh, in terms of channeling or psychic abilities, whatever you wish to call it. Now, you mentioned improving our lives by embracing this concept and these skills. People have been integrating psychic phenomena and practices in their daily life for thousands of years, as we know, to improve it in one way or another, whether with insight about medicinal plants or healing crystals or prophetic messages about some important events in the future. How developing and utilizing these skills in this day and age can be of benefit to us? That's a wonderful question. What I see is the most impactful of the many, many benefits that I think come from this type of work is in supporting people around decision making. People can feel paralyzed, overwhelmed, anxious, depressed when faced with the myriad of choices that come at them every day, especially if they're hooked into social media, into the news, into all the external sources of information that is like standing in front of a fire hydrant. It's so hard to know what to do (laughs) (laughs) and where, you know, where each person's um, path should flow because so many choices. So I find that Nurturing people's channeling ability supports them to become more clear about what is my highest and best next step to not ignore the external information, but discern what is most relevant to take in. And then from their own inner authority, choose what is best for them. Now, You know, many people will also say, oh, this material was channeled like they get some script from a a channeler and they'll project their authority onto that information or they'll assume if it's channeled that it's true and should apply to them and that they should act on it. But that is just not right yes <laughs> <laughs> that there is a there is a very important level of discernment that we should each be taking to decide is this i i don't even ask is it true i feel like the more important question is is this true for me yes in this moment is this relevant for me is there any type of action that i need to take in regards to this Those are the more important questions rather than, oh, this was channeled. I should follow what they said. Yes, this is so absolutely important. So thank you for pointing this out. I just want to follow up with one other piece around that. There have been a number of studies asking various types of channelers if they, the impact that channeling has had on their lives. And overwhelming, the answer is that it has a positive impact on people's lives. So I think that that's really important to mention as well, beyond this decision-making piece. And I think that's just one of the benefits of channeling. Mm, Absolutely. Can some forms of channeling be dangerous? And of course, I'm referring to the infamous Ouija board (laughs) as an example And can we energetically protect our aura, our energy field? Have you ever had a negative psychic experience? That's a, that's a number of really good questions. (laughs) So I can speak to this mostly from my personal channel or hat. As far as I know, there have not been formal studies done on this specific question. And part of it is because of ethics, because it's hard to to conduct a research study like this. But my Mm -hmm. personal, growing up, I was always warned, do not play with a Ouija board. Um, Do not, you know, play around with channeling as a game. And to always set intention for safety, for protection, for the highest level of energy and guidance around you. And most of the traditions that I have learned about 
have some aspect of this integrated into their practices, into their training, etc. And I think this goes back to the power of intention and the power of our consciousness. And so to answer your question simply, can some forms of channeling be dangerous? I would say the short answer is yes. Now, do I want people to be afraid of channeling? No. Is this something, you know, that is a high risk activity? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I think that it needs to be done with intention and that it is very simple to bring in a safe and positive container with which to tap into your intuitive capacities. Now, the other aspect of your question was, have I ever had a negative psychic experience? Um, I personally have, and most of it was around um, being energetically overwhelmed. So my personal understanding is that we have an energetic system, the aura and the various chakras. And because of my individual noetic signature, I'm very sensitive to people's energy and emotions. So if I was not mindful and didn't use my tools and I went into a very large crowd where people were angry or had high negative emotion, I would leave there feeling very, very bad. <laughs> and in the past, I would have even gotten physically ill. Now, I have learned how to manage my energetic system and how to put on an energetic raincoat, if you will. And I talk about that in my book, the various tools that you use to help work with your system. Because just because we can channel doesn't mean that we want to channel 100% of the time, you know, of our whole day. It is really a tool that we can nurture and learn how to manage to support us. So that's one piece that I can share with the audience. The other piece is a really fascinating concept that I've been exploring more recently, which is the spiritualist. Well, I don't know if it's spiritualist. I think there's many, many traditions that talk about this. And again, this is Helene's personal hat of um, an earthbound spirit. Or let's just assume for the moment that we have a spirit or soul and a consciousness that survives our physical death. And that when our body dies, our consciousness moves on from our body to another dimension or realm or heaven or whatever fits in with your belief system. Now, what I have experienced slash learned is that Sometimes when people pass, if it happened suddenly, or it was traumatic, or if they were raised in a tradition that they were afraid of punishment when they died, or they were very ill and didn't real and were drugged up and didn't realize that they died, that they could actually stay stuck on the physical plane and could actually affect humans and even become attached to humans. So I've been experiencing this in various ways and reading about a lot of practitioners who do this work, whether we can prove that the earthbound spirit is really an earthbound spirit or not, that this work of clearing those beings has clear clinical effects, positive outcomes when we uh, do spiritual practices to help these supposed earthbound spirits move on. So these negative psychic experiences, you know, sometimes someone might have a, a living person goes to a hospital for a procedure, and then when they leave, they have all these new symptoms that they've never had before. They want to smoke cigarettes. They have this weird cough. 
they are very, very depressed and have suicidal ideation, which they never had before. There is an incredible uh, clinician, Edith Fiore, who would work with patients like these and do these practices to clear them. And then the symptoms would just immediately dissipate. So we could talk for another couple hours about that specific topic, but I'm, I'm becoming very interested in that. And I'd love to find a way to merge this with my scientific hat and learn if we could study that in some way. We recently did a panel about this at IONS, and I had a variety of scientists and practitioners talking about it. And one idea was to work with um, people who have schizophrenic symptoms and just, you know, act as if this is a real phenomenon, do the process and see if their symptoms improve um, and see what happens. So that's just one fun way um, to bring the science and the spirit together around that. You must have read my mind just just then because that was my next question and, and next point. But before I get to that, uh, there is one good analogy that came to my mind as, as you were speaking a minute ago about channeling being a quote-unquote high-risk activity if not done properly. And the analogy is it's like driving a car. Is driving a car a risky activity? Yes, you can get killed, you can you can kill other people. Does it mean that you should be scared of driving and not drive? No. You need to learn the rules, you need to learn how to drive, you need to master the skill. So in other words, it's about how well we can manage the process, how well we can master the process so that the risk is mediated to, well, there's always a risk, I guess, but but is mediated to the extent possible. And yes, we can still all enjoy yes. driving a car every day. <laughs> so I thought that this was a good uh, analogy which just came to me from the spirit <laughs> as you were speaking. And to follow on your last point, spirit attachments can explain, that's in my view and in my level of knowledge, can explain medically unexplainable cases such as schizophrenia that you mentioned, when the same person displays different physical and psychological and physiological states in different personalities that they display or engage with at any point in time or bring forward. For example, I've read studies where the same person had myopia or short-sightedness in one personality few minutes later, when another personality came forward, they had absolutely perfect 20-20 vision. And those tests uh, were carried out by professional doctors. So it was not an imagination or, or a hearsay. Likewise, with diabetes, uh, hypertension and other tests that can be conducted just by blood test. So this completely defies the knowledge of medicine around those physiological and physical symptoms, which normally cannot simply come and go at will within a span of few minutes. So my question is, firstly, what are your thoughts about it? And secondly, are you aware or are you planning to conduct any studies? So in other words, whether you, you would see a value of pursuing this research path to find out what is going on here? Absolutely. And, you know, you think about it, these cases that you just mentioned, most of them are, you know, tough cases that no one knows what to do with, right? So even if we can't prove the survival hypothesis, like even if we can't prove whether it really is a earthbound spirit attachment, in my mind, it doesn't matter. Because if you actually did this clinical practice with the acting as if, and you saw marked improvements, then who cares if it really is an earthbound or not? 
because you're getting positive results. So my view is that we have not definitively proved the survival hypothesis using, you know, the rigorous scientific objective tools that we have today. That's not to say that we couldn't prove it in quotes in the future. And I really don't like using the word prove in the past. And yet, I don't think that that necessarily really matters if we are getting positive results. Do I want to do a study on this? Absolutely. The key is going to be finding a psychiatrist or some sort of uh, clinic that treats these patients who is who would be willing to allow us to do a randomized control trial with their patients using these methods. And we have yet to find that. I will say that there are hospitals in Brazil that are doing this type of work in the spiritist community. But in the West, I haven't found anyone who would be willing to collaborate in that way to do a formal study. And then, of course, there's always the aspect of research funding and finding someone to fund that work. But we do have uh, in, uh, ethics board at IONS. We are very well placed to be able to implement this study. So if any of your listeners have connections to be able to make that happen, I would be very interested in learning about that. One first step that we're going to take is to start a database where practitioners could add their name to this database if they wanted to, to be approached by clients and to also create, you know, a single place where all of these people who are interested in doing this work could um, see each other, connect with each other, create a network of people who are doing this work. Because I know there's many, many who are, but they are disparate and not connecting with each other. Mm, absolutely. Now, are you aware of those case studies which have been recorded, as I said, I, I read them some years ago. I don't recall the source, but they were published studies, case studies of people diagnosed with schizophrenia who were displaying different physiological and physical symptoms, depending on which personality they brought forward at that point in time. And things like one minute you have myopia, the next minute you don't, which is medically confirmed through tests, is unexplainable. Oh, yes. Yes. Sorry, I didn't address that. I am very aware of those. And it's absolutely incredible. And to me, it's not surprising because I am very bought into the idea that our consciousness affects our physical body and the interplay between our mind and our body and our spirit. And so from a materialistic perspective, it seems impossible. But if you hold that our consciousness actually affects our physicality, then it makes perfect sense. Because whether that person is holding three separate distinct entities or whether they are having three separate personalities, it's that personality's consciousness is manifesting different physicality. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, and that, you know, we, we often walk around in our bodies thinking that it is so static and unchangeable and yet when you see cases like that, it is just absolutely amazing to see the power of the mind, the power of consciousness to affect the physical world. Do you enjoy relaxing meditations? Do you like inspirational thoughts and introspection? I'd like to tell you about my brand new guided meditations album released just this month which combines all of that in a new genre of inspirational meditation. It's called Inspirational Meditations for Each Day of the Week, and that's exactly what it is. Seven superbly relaxing guided meditations on a soft musical background, one for each day of the week, 
Monday to Sunday. They are not just relaxing, but also inspirational and introspective. Each meditation is focused on the corresponding chakra, from the root chakra on Monday to the crown chakra on Sunday, exploring how these energy centers affect our personality and behavior. The inspirational guidance is positive, uplifting, encouraging introspection, and includes a different powerful mantra for each day of the week. You will find this album in the store on my website at quantumliving.com.au, where you can also listen to the highlights. So, check it out. And now, back to today's episode. Absolutely. And these types of cases, in my view, open the door to the study of the concept of mind over matter, as you mentioned, because if our consciousness can affect our physical body to such an extent, the case of people with multiple personalities is especially intriguing for me because there could be at least two different types of causes or explanation. One is multiple personality or more than one soul fragment incarnated in, in one physical body or an entity attachment which makes itself known as a different personality and also somehow has the power to affect the physiology or, or physical states of the person. So it's, it is incredibly fascinating and I'm really hoping that your institute or someone would be able to study this phenomenon because it is mind opening and it's moving the horizons to infinity. So let's now take this one step further into the spiritual aspect of that topic. Now, you talk about the family DNA in terms of predispositions or inclinations for channeling. I also would like to add to this mix the soul DNA, which is based on the soul archetype and its chosen pathway, which can be verified by the predominant patterns in the person's past lives, for example. What are your thoughts about the soul DNA allowing or giving us a greater capacity to use our sixth sense in addition to the family DNA and the ancestral lineage? That's a great question and something I'm very, very interested in. I'd like to just give a little bit of background before I jump to the soul DNA. So when you look at the research that's already been done, we see that anecdotally, people talk about these experiences running in their families. So, you know, I see it in my family, other people see these channeling experiences in their family. There were one survey study done in Scotland, where they found that it ran in families. They also did a pedigree analysis where they saw that it ran in families. But as far as I know, IONS is the only formal study that has actually looked at the genetics of psychic ability in a very small genetic study where we looked at 13 psychics and their full genome and compared them to age, gender, and racially matched controls, which were people who didn't have any uh, psychic experiences at all. And when we looked at the DNA of these two groups, we actually did not see any differences in the hard-coded genes. There was no significant difference. What we did see was a difference in what people call the non-coding DNA. This used to be called junk DNA, but now they know it's not junk. It actually does something, but it doesn't code directly for proteins. It kind of moderates or modulates or, or has some, you know, managing role. And so we found that there was a difference on this chromosome seven. So this is a very small pilot study, and it definitely needs to be replicated. But what was fascinating is when we looked at that non-coding region in a larger database that had thousands and thousands of people's records, 
we found that the psychic version was actually the original, what's called the wild type version of that gene. And that it was very, very prevalent. It was like the dominant expression of that uh, gene, which makes sense because channeling is very common, right? So it's this common expression. And then we also saw that it was had a relationship with the spread of Christianity. So we know that in our history that these experiences were persecuted and people who had them were killed and tortured and, you know, taken out of the population pool, unfortunately. And so uh, we saw that there was a relationship with that. And there was also a stronger relationship with technology. So if you envision that our psychic abilities helped us find the buffalo, it was our internal compass to find our game and survive. Uh, the more countries ha- were technologically advanced, the more they had the mutation, which is away from this psychic ability. So as far as we know, that's the only study that has formally evaluated the genetics of psychic ability in that way. And we're, we're now trying to raise funds so we can do a much larger study to confirm that. Now, my hypothesis is that uh, genetics is not the only determining factor for our channeling ability. Like I mentioned, I, I am proposing that everybody can channel in some way. But I hypothesize that the genetics may influence the type of channeling that we are better at than others. You know, you take, like you mentioned, musical talent or professional sport talent. You know, I, as a 5'2 uncoordinated person, is not, I'm not going to be an excellent basketball player, you know, but my, my husband who's 6'2 and, and very athletic is going to be much better. So I believe our genes may influence the type of channeling that we do. I also, have seen and talked to many, many teachers who say that channeling can be learned, that we can set an intention, we can practice, we can be diligent uh, and put our minds to learning any type of channeling we want to, but that doesn't mean we're going to be excellent at it. So remote viewing teachers say, hey, I can teach everyone, but they're not all going to be excellent or I know someone else who teaches um, psychokinesis, and he says, you know, everyone who believes that they can do it can, but they're just not going to be great. Not everyone's going to be great. So that's what I know about genetics and channeling ability and the DNA. Now, you mentioned this whole piece of soul DNA. We have learned so much about our DNA with our current technologies. And yet there's still so much that we do not know. And from a spiritual perspective, you do hear people talking about how our soul code, as you mentioned, is imprinted in our DNA. I've heard a lot of channeled content about that, the information that is just densely packed into our DNA. I've heard things like, you know, we are evolving from 3D beings to 5D beings, and that's going to be activating our DNA to open up different capacities. I don't have any scientific background to support that in any way. And I have no idea if that's objectively true or not. It makes intuitive sense to me. Because you look at the DNA and it's such an incredible molecule on a physical and energetic level. And you can just envision the amount of information that is stored in there. And that also ties to this growing evidence for the concept that information is actually 
the fundamental bedrock <clears throat> of reality. Absolutely. That it's actually Jude Curvin who talks about this a lot in her book, The Cosmic Hologram, which I highly recommend, that the universe is essentially information, that we are all information in various forms. And I can't begin to try to explain it as eloquently as she did, but it ties in, in my mind, to this DNA piece and that the amount of information that could be stored in there. And it makes sense to me that the more access we have to this greater information, then the more we could expand into our capacities. Yes, absolutely. As you were speaking just then, a thought came to my mind about the soul DNA. And the insight that I have received is that the soul information, which we can refer to as soul DNA, is within the energy field surrounding the non-coding DNA, the physical non-coding DNA. That's why it is not coding in a normal way, like all other DNA. That's why it's different. And it's, oh, I'm now getting goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> and the purpose of the quote unquote junk DNA is to hold the aura or the energetic field of the soul information in the body that is designed for the body. I never thought about it this way, but it just came to me as you were speaking. So I thought I felt compelled to, <laughs> to say this. It's fascinating because I'm fascinated by this specific topic. I too have felt on a channeling level um, the importance of the DNA. But what's fascinating is that every time we try to move forward on this research program, we hit obstacles and we keep hitting obstacles. And you know, we've gotten some feedback from people about the ethics and the ethical concerns of looking at psychic ability and genetics and that it could be used in a very negative way. So if we somehow learn to crack the soul code of the DNA or learn how to, you know, what aspects of our DNA will open up our psychic abilities that it could be used by people with negative intent. And so I don't take these things lightly. So if I continue to hit walls, to me, that's a sign that perhaps this information is not quite ready for prime time. And that when it is ready, it will open up, the funders will show up, and the research can move forward. So I'm not sure if it is a maturity level of humanity to be able to fully embrace the information to come through and to use it wisely that's blocking it. I really don't know, but I've never shared this in a podcast and such, but it's it's a very fascinating aspect to this work that we've faced. Mm. And another analogy that came to my mind, speaking of ethics or the negative versus positive intention with which we use information is that when you take a knife and you have a good intention, you will chop your veggies for dinner. If you grab a knife with bad intentions, with negative intentions, to harm someone is the same tool, the same environment, perhaps. The only difference is the intention. And again, just like I was talking earlier about driving a car, we can't, and it wouldn't be, I guess, wise <laughs> to forbid people from using knives, just like, you know, we, we wouldn't prohibit driving a car because you might kill yourself or kill others. Now, one particular point that I would like to raise around ethics is accessing information about other people at the soul level, the Akashic Records level, whatever you want to call it, the universal mind 
accessing information, very personal, very intimate of information about people without necessarily their knowledge and permission. And if that's the case, my two questions or my two points are that one, I believe that every person should be able to protect themselves energetically. So that's something that can be taught and learned. And secondly, there is a, an ethical issue f- for a psychic or channeler or a person accessing this information to not to access it without the person's explicit permission. Now, I've heard views that, no, this is not possible. So this is very similar to your information being online on the internet. Once it's there, it's up for grabs. Anyone can grab it. Well, yeah, no, as we say it in Australia, <laughs> not quite because that wouldn't be ethical. And obviously there are people who wouldn't care less and they will use information for their advantage. But in terms of the ethical issue, how can we navigate it to, on the one hand, to protect ourselves and and our information and access to it, but on the other hand, to not stall, not hinder our research and inquiry into these concepts, uh, perhaps with one, with one proviso of the humanity not being quite ready, i.e. not evolved to, to a certain level of spirituality, which wouldn't even allow non-ethical actions. If you could possibly pick some of the points that I have mentioned to address, so essentially around the ethics and not stalling the progress of our scientific inquiry. Yes, this is so essentially important, I think, in this work. And I'll start by saying that I think this is one of the major reasons why there are taboos about looking at channeling, studying channeling, is that people are afraid. They're afraid, well, what does it mean if someone could access my information or read my mind or you know, affect me with their consciousness? What if that person exhibiting road rage really could make me crash immediately, you know? And so there's a lot of fear around that. And, you know, most traditions that I am aware of who have formal practices do practice impeccable ethics, you know, where they ask for permission on some level, whether it's physically or at a higher self level, They're very conscious and aware of not overstepping. There is training to energetically protect yourself. Now, this whole concept of energetic protection, I mean, I did mention it before because I know my personal makeup is energetically sensitive. And yet when you think, well, if we're all one, if we're all interconnected, then what the heck do I have to protect myself from anyway? And depending on the spiritual teacher you speak to, they're going to have different views on this. You know, some might say there's nothing to protect yourself against because we're all the same thing. And if your ego self, your personality is clear enough, then nothing's going to stick to you. It's just, you know, like as I walk into that crowd, if I'm clear enough, the anger is going to flow through me and it's not going to stick. And I'm not going to be physically affected by it. Others might say, no, you need to put a protective bubble, whether it's blue or green or gold or et cetera. You need to tighten down your energetic system and, you know, put on the energetic battle suit (laughs) to go out (laughs) into the world. And I am a person of the gray. I think it's all of the above right now. I feel like. Part of it is where where our current world is at right now, because we have so many people who are, you know, deeply ethical, impeccable. They hold the highest and best for themselves and others. They have, you know, deeply positive intentions from a altruistic perspective. Then we have people who are not, who are very selfish, egotistical, negative intentions. Our planet is in this very tumultuous trans transformational space where all of it exists at the same time. And so I envision a world someday where 
we wouldn't necessarily need to have protections or need to feel like we needed to block ourselves from prying psychic eyes, you know, Mm. (laughs) that, you know, we would all be heart centered and positively intended. And we wouldn't care if someone bumped into information about me in the psychic internet, Mm -hmm. because there's no danger for me in that. You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, But this is a future world that I'm envisioning. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're there quite yet. And that we do need to be very, very impeccable in how we go about studying this and training it and doing our practices to keep ourselves safe and healthy and whole. Yes. Yes. God, these are such fascinating topics and we could be talking for another several hours, but <laughs> but time is catching up with us. So what I would like to spend the, the last few minutes of our conversation is firstly to promote your book, The Science of Channeling. So I might ask you if you could give us the synopsis and perhaps tell us briefly about it. And yes, I will include the link in the show notes for people to access it and purchase it. And an additional question around the book is whether this is the first book on this topic or treating the topic of channeling in this way. And then I might ask you to tell us briefly about the IONS and the cutting edge work that is being done under its auspices. And again, how people could get involved in it if they are interested. The science of channeling is based on the IONS channeling research program. So I shared about my personal experience. And so when I came to IONS, I was so excited to be able to study this formally and building upon the work that IONS had already done on this area. And of course, integrating the wonderful work of many scientists around the world who have researched channeling, I built a research program around important questions about channeling. What do we already know? How common is it? Who can channel? Is the information useful? How does it work? What is the source? And putting that all together, we have multiple different studies that we've done on each of those research questions. So I put that all into this book in a very accessible way. It's meant for the general public, describing all the evidence about is channeling real Um, in a very digestible way so that people could understand it. And then a final chapter that goes through the common aspects of practice, of channeling practice, so that people could begin their own uh, journey of learning how to tap into this noetic wisdom, this inner wisdom within themselves. So that's the Science of Channeling book. I would love your audience to check it out. It's also available on audiobook. And this work is at IONS. IONS was founded by Edgar Mitchell, who was actually an Apollo 14 astronaut and the sixth person to walk on the moon. And we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, which is amazing. IONS has been studying interconnection and how we are all interconnected in its various ways. Um, It has that premise that we're all interconnected and that when we embody that interconnectedness, we can access information and energy from beyond time and space, which in turn can profoundly amplify our innovation, transformation, and well-being. We have a wonderful five-person multidisciplinary science team, which is holds the science aspect of IONS. And we also have an experience and engagement department, which pr- provides curriculums and webinars, because we love this noetic handshake when the two are interacting with each others. We have uh, the IONS Channeling Research Program, We have the IONS Discovery Lab, where we look at transformative practices and how that changes people. And we also have IONS X, which is a cutting edge application driven program looking at how consciousness affects the physical world. So those are our main research programs at this moment. 
We'd love you to check out our website, which is noetic, N-O-E-T-I-C dot org. We have free blogs, free webinars, all our publications and projects, participate in research. We'd love to have you join our community. Oh, how beautiful. Thank you. And yes, I have joined it already and will participate in some of the projects that you are running at the Institute. And I would encourage everyone interested in these topics to explore, give it a go, do a survey. And who knows, maybe even if you are currently not that interested in channeling or psychic abilities, the information that you have heard on this show and what you can find out on the website and through interaction with the Institute might just change that. Well, Dr. Wabi, my final point, as you said, we don't really know how this works, but I'd like to ask you to speculate. If you did know, what would it be? And here is the punchline. (laughs) Why can't we simply ask the spirit in our channeling? Please tell us, how does it work? And if someone did ask, why there is still no answer? (laughs) (laughs) I love this question because I have actually explicitly asked that question in channeling. Oh, How does channeling work? Because that is one of the main questions of the IONS channeling research program. And naive Helene expected a simple answer that it would just be, oh, it works like this. (laughs) What we have found through our research studies looking at brain waves, heart waves, skin waves, the whole physiology of the body, all these different aspects. And also when we've asked channelers during channeling sessions, what we have found is that there is no one way, that it really depends on who the channeler is, who the perceived source is, who the audience is, that there are likely multiple different mechanisms based on all of those factors. I go into this quite a bit in my book, so I invite you and your audience to explore that more fully. Like everything in our lives, it's nuanced, it's complex, and it varies. And the most important piece in that is intention. That if you believe in channeling, if you believe that you can channel, and you set positive, focused intention for your channeling ability to unfold, that you will find that it will. Absolutely. And it is a truly quantum phenomenon, which means it can be categorized, can be (laughs) described fully, can be pinpointed. It's like quicksilver. Yes. It's either this or that. It's either here or there, which I'm loving. (laughs) (laughs) A typical, beautiful quantum phenomenon. So really, my question was redundant (laughs) in this regard. (laughs) Thank you so much. And is there any final thought or comment you would like to share to leave our audience with before we close? I would just invite everybody to, if they can, take one minute to be still, to be quiet, to go within. And if it feels right to them, to set the intention to be able to hear their inner wisdom, to set that intention that their inner voice be strengthened so that they may be more easily guided in what is in their highest and best in each moment. Oh, beautiful. Dr. Weber, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you on, on my podcast Thank you, Anna. It's been a pleasure. I could be speaking with you for another several hours. This is a never-ending topic and a great fascination for me and I'm sure for many other people. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and your beautiful thoughts and contribution. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. That was really fun. I love getting into the more personal stuff because it's just You know, it's fun. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, 
Please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.